Dean, thank you very much. Am I holding the mic about right? Can you hear me? Upstairs okay? Uh, good evening. It is a, really a pleasure for uh, my Indiana Gas Company colleagues and myself to be here with you. Uh, I'm really impressed with the turnout, uh, the fact that we have uh, so many students who are interested uh, in the, the subject matter that they're studying that they come out on a night voluntarily uh, to hear uh, a distinguished lecturer uh, like you'll hear this evening. Uh, but congratulations, uh, I'm impressed. Uh, we are your local natural gas company. We supply natural gas to the community of Muncie and to your university, and we have for many years uh, had a, a good business relationship with uh, Ball State. The president of Ball State serves on the board of directors of Indiana Energy, our parent company. So we also have a special relationship through the very top leadership organization of your university. Uh, you heard briefly about the partnership that we've entered into. It is, we believe, uh, a, a very uh, efficient and a creative way to leverage the uh, talent and the resources of uh, Indiana Gas Company and Indiana Energy uh, and the resources and the talents at Ball State and the College of Architecture and Planning. So I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this program tonight, uh, an ongoing program that represents a five-year commitment to your college. And uh, the most exciting part of uh, my involvement this evening will be to present the first Indiana Energy Scholarships to uh, two of your fellow students. So we'll be doing that very shortly. Thank you. Just stay here. Let me just take a moment to describe some of the components of this, this partnership program. Uh, a key portion of this is the development of a series of demonstration homes that will obviously focus upon uh, the creation of energy efficient homes using uh, natural gas. The first of these homes is currently under construction, uh, featuring um, various energy efficiencies in the design uh, of this particular home. It's being built down in, in fissures. It is pretty well framed up at this point, and we are looking forward to a January 15th opening of the house, and it will be uh, on display, and it will be open uh, to the public and for a series of events for approximately uh, a month's time. This first home has been designed by a faculty team led by Associate Dean Michelle Munyar, uh, Professor Hari Egink, and also Bob Kester, the director of the Energy Center, have also been consulting uh, on this particular project. Two additional homes will be developed within the College of Architecture and Planning over the five-year period of this partnership. We are currently working on the research agenda for the second home, and we will be putting together a team of students and faculty who will be working together uh, in the design of this second home. Another very important component of this partnership program is the uh, support of student-sponsored community projects. Last year, Indiana Gas uh, made in-kind gifts to the university's chapter of Habitat for Humanity in the construction of the home, which was entirely built and financed uh, by the uh, very dedicated efforts of members of the student chapter. And in the years to come, there will be funds available to any of the student organizations of this college who are sponsoring community service uh, programs or activities. Another component is the provision of support for additional library resources for the college. Uh, the reason that we are uh, talking about this partnership tonight is that Indiana Gas is also a sponsor of the college's lecture series. And you probably saw this particular lecture advertised as uh, the Indiana Gas Lecture. And then finally, a large portion of the gift of Indiana uh, Gas, Indiana Energy to the college uh, is in the form of scholarships. 
and we will be awarding five scholarships uh, for a full five years duration uh, over the course of uh, the next uh, year or so. We have already made two awards for first year students uh, currently enrolled in the College of Architecture and Planning and I'll ask Mr. Baker if he will present uh, certificates to those two award recipients at this time. Thank you. The first Inter Indiana Energy Scholar is Myra Stem. <laughs> Myra, congratulations. Look forward to this. Thank you. Our second recipient is Ozias Burnett. <clears throat> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Mitchell, Chair of the Department of Urban Planning, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. It is a distinct pleasure for me tonight to be able to introduce to you someone who is not only a distinguished lecturer, but more importantly for me, actually, a former student of mine. And uh, that doesn't always happen, so when it does, we, uh, we rejoice in that. Liz Bloom graduated from Ball State University with an undergraduate degree uh, in the College of Architecture and Planning in the Urban and Regional Studies program, went on to get a graduate degree in planning from the University of Cincinnati, began working in the Department of Neighborhood Housing in Cincinnati for about a year, and then took a job with Wolpert Consultants, a national consulting firm with headquarters offices in Dayton. She was there for five years before she moved to the city of Dayton. Uh, she actually was in the city of Dayton, but moved her career to work for the city of Dayton as a principal planner, a position which she held for some six years. Uh, she worked in a lot of neighborhood kinds of settings. She eventually became the director of the Department of Planning for the city of Dayton, a position which she held for four years, during which the department became not only a Department of Planning, but also a Department of Planning and Community Development, and during which, the, uh, under her leadership, the City of Dayton completed an award-winning plan, the 2020 vision for the City of Dayton. Most recently, in fact, just within the past three months, uh, she has been appointed the Director of the Department of City Planning for the City of Cincinnati. It's a distinct pleasure to welcome Liz Bloom. Gonna put that in here. Yeah. All right, can everybody hear me? It's really nice to be here. I, I really appreciate <laughs> I really appreciated the opportunity to come back, and I certainly want to thank Indiana Gas for having me in Ball State. Um, it's nice to come back. I think it's I graduated about 20 some years ago and uh, it, it's it's nice to feel like I'm back with my roots um, tonight and, and Paul didn't mention and I tonight I want to talk about the politics of planning um, and I also have a degree or a, a major from Ball State in political science and so I suppose to some extent that uh, prepared me for the environment in planning that I that I find myself in but but what I want to I think the message that I want to leave tonight is that we shouldn't as planners assume that politics and playing politics and figuring out what the political environment is is a bad thing. In fact, I would suggest to you that successful planners and successful plans are plans that do in fact understand what the political environment is all about and, and respond to that political environment. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes and talk about politics because there's such a negative connotation and here on the eve of an election night, and this is probably appropriate, 
I think political scientists would probably define politics as, as the study of power. And it's about numbers. It's about how many votes you get, how much money you can bring to the table, how many people or sentiment you can generate. Oftentimes, I think, though, sort of raw politics is a numbers game. And, and I would suggest to you that from a planning perspective, the definition of politics is a little bit different. Um, for me, I think politics is about understanding the dynamics of change in a complicated environment. My, I thought that up about a week ago, and I thought I better write that down. I actually have it written down here to say. Um, politics is about understanding the dynamics of change in a complicated environment. Most planners, most plans look to change things. Very few people are happy totally in a constant state of sameness. <laughs> and I think that most communities would like to change, would like to better themselves. So planning, I think, is about moving from one place to another, trying to take what is a complicated environment and get a whole set of actors, a whole bunch of folks who have different agendas and different needs to move in a unified direction. And I think you just cannot be successful at that unless you understand what the political environment that you find yourself in is and respond to that in some way. So what I'm suggesting is politics is not a bad thing. It's a necessary thing. It describes a group of complicated folks who all have different agendas and try to figure out what it is that's going to move them, move them to change in the direction that you want them to go in or that they collectively decide that they want to go in. Um, and, and I want to talk, I keep saying complicated environment. Um, certainly, Dayton is a complicated environment to live in. Cincinnati is a complicated environment to live in. I think the larger cities get and the more diverse the population gets, the more complicated life becomes. Back, back in the olden days when there was one school and one city hall and one grocery store and 50 houses and some farms, you could make, you could pretty easily make big decisions like where the next bridge was going to go or where the next road was going to go. I mean, that was a relatively simple environment to make that kind of a decision in. Today, things are much more difficult, and the interests are much more diverse in communities that we plan in. And so politics becomes essential. Um, it still is about numbers. I can't tell you how many times there are five city commissioners in Dayton, including the mayor, and I can't tell you how many times the mantra, does anybody know how to count to three, goes. And in Cincinnati, there are nine commissioners, including the mayor, so there the magic number is five. And what that means is you've got to know where the votes are going to go. So on, on the bald face of it, politics is still a numbers game. But the kind of planning environment that you've got to work in is, is much more complex than simply counting votes. What I want to do tonight is talk about three different kinds of planning processes and explain what, what my take, if you will, on the political environment is in neighborhood planning, in city comprehensive planning, and then in regional planning. And to talk about neighborhood planning, which is where I'm going to go first, so I, I have a tale of two neighborhoods to tell you about. I want to walk you through two neighborhood plans, and, and I will tell you, and I was the principal planner on both of them, so I can tell you honestly, one of them was a success and one of them was a failure. If you define failure as a plan that was done and then not implemented. I have some slides. Cue the slides. I'm going to talk. I'm on the left side or the right side? The left side. All right. What do I point at? Ah, uh, technology. It's a wonderful thing. We had this all figured out this afternoon. It worked beautifully. <laughs> yes, there's an on switch. Oh, yes, there's an on switch. And now that I've pushed it, it can probably.
Well, that's not the one that... I want to talk to you about a neighborhood plan in city of Dayton, which was a neighborhood plan along the East 5th Street corridor. This is a neighborhood that included for the, the Oregon district in Dayton, which is the most successful historic district in the city of Dayton. It included the entertainment district that Dayton has, if there is one, that's patronized by downtown residents, downtown businesses, the University of Dayton, probably the most active um, entertainment district in the city. It included the downtown convention center. It included an up and coming historic district, St. Anne's. In short, what it included was all of the ingredients that one would expect it takes to make a successful neighborhood revitalization effort. The goals were three in the residential area to strengthen residential character, again, the most successful historic district in town and the, the hottest up and coming historic district in town. It wanted to address large structures and institutions, including the convention center, several large well-established churches, and several other significant downtown businesses, and improve the streetscape in a neighborhood business district that actually had neighborhood business happening. So what you've got here is from a physical and design standpoint, all of the things that one would expect to make a successful neighborhood revitalization process. We have a plan map, which by, my, in my opinion, is some very nice graphics. The presentation was good. There was a lot of good detail work done, and I'm gonna move through these, because what, what I want to demonstrate to you in some of these slides is that there was a lot of good planning, technical work done in this process. We worked out, ooh, focus, there we go. We worked out details of entryways. We worked out parking lot details. We worked out funding strategies. This is an infill housing site in the up and coming historic district neighborhood that should have been benefiting from significantly increasing real estate values. Nice presentation. Adrian Fine, by the way, who did a lot of this graphic work is also a graduate of this program. It's really nice work. The Oregon component actually done by an outside consulting firm. Again, the Oregon district, money from business owners, businesses in buildings. We wanted to maximize existing structures, enhance pedestrian connections. This is a business district right next to downtown. We wanted to expand boundaries and coordinate management with a lot of ongoing businesses who were making money. There's the Oregon District piece, parking was an issue. Parking and congestion, when you think about neighborhood business districts, are often good problems to have because what it means is there's a market there and there are people there who want to be there. Nice character of the neighborhood business district environment, businesses that were selling stuff, whoa. Convention center where there had just been some significant capital funds spent in the area with a lot of convention business. There's the convention center. And I'm gonna stop here because what, I, what I've just described to you is an environment with all of the right ingredients for a successful neighborhood revitalization study. And what I wanna tell you is this is the unsuccessful example. The presentation was good. The details were right. The design was good. We did, we had, we had an architectural consulting firm in town do as built and specific redevelopment cost estimates for the large buildings that we wanted to renovate. We had every base covered from a technical design standpoint and the politics weren't right and this plan went nowhere. And I still lament this. This is probably one of the better technical plan neighborhood planning processes that, that I put together in my time in Dayton. And it was a tremendous disappointment. And I'm gonna go back through the, the environment, the pieces there. The city of Dayton and a consultant worked with a community group not totally representative of the business community and a group looking for the city to produce something for them, to make something happen. 
but they were not a community that was interested in making things happen for themselves. And as a result of that, nothing happened. Lots of good technical background, lots of good design work, very solid technical rec recommendations, and the politics weren't right, and it went nowhere. This neighborhood, every year, the city of Dayton has a process that's called the priority needs process, where each neighborhood in the city has an opportunity to say to city government, this is what we want you to do in our neighborhood. And year after year after year, this neighborhood said, implement our plan. But they made no effort, and they were not motivated, no cash ever came forward, none of these businesses were willing to participate with shared parking. There was never any real movement by the residents or the businesses in this community. And so the only things that ever happened were the public improvements. And I'll tell you, brick pavers and trees only go so far. The other neighborhood plan that I want to talk about is the Old North Dayton plan. And I don't have the kind of graphics to show you for the Old North Dayton plan that I did for Fifth Street, because we didn't do them. The Old North Dayton plan um, in a neighborhood, let me, let me describe the neighborhood. How many of you are familiar? How many of you are, <laughs> thank you. How many of you are familiar with Dayton, if anybody? I know there are usually Dayton folks in, at Ball State. Old North Dayton is a neighborhood that is a blue collar, working class neighborhood, starting to see disinvestment. Also the neighborhood that Children's Medical Center is sitting in. Um, but Children's Medical Center in large part was the major business institution presence in the neighborhood. And that was really all that Old North Dayton had going for it. Um, Luke class, pretty standard neighborhood, very traditional, not historically designated neighborhood business district that was sort of working, still had a grocery store, still had a drug store, but was definitely showing signs of disinvestment. And that was Old North Dayton. And, and there's Children's Medical Center. And that was the neighborhood associate. That was, that was what we had to work with there. No historic district, no residential property values on the increase, um, some open space that was uh, created as a result of the fact that the hospital had done a lot of building demolition and their intent had been to try and get rid of blight that was across the street from the hospital and scaring their patients. And the neighborhood, and I will tell you, the neighborhood plan grew up out of a horrible conflict between the hospital and the neighborhood. The neighborhood felt as though the hospital was sort of doing battle with the neighborhood. And the hospital's response to poor neighborhood conditions was tear down bad looking housing. And the neighborhood and the hospital, as you can imagine, were in a real pitched battle for a long time as a result of. That, that process, conflicting needs. The hospital feels like its patients need to feel safe when they're there, and the residents feel like the hospital needs to be a better neighbor and not gobble them up. This is Flood Memorial Park, which is in the location that, there's the hospital, that's Children's Medical Center in Old North Dayton. This is the park that is now housed in the place where the battle took place between Children's Medical Center and the neighborhood. Um, they formed, the, the hospital and the neighborhood association formed a development corporation, which was a political entity, a legal entity that could, a development corporation, buy and sell property, do redevelopment, actually do community redevelopment work. They did that of their own fruition. Then they came to the city and said, okay, now we've got a development corporation, we are sort of, we've sort of made up here because we went together to form this development corporation. Children's Medical Center seeded the development corporation with about $100,000 to begin with, but they were still having a real love-hate relationship. They came to the city and said, now will you do a plan for us so that we can best move forward with this revitalization effort? So at the request of a development corporation who wanted to know what they could do with cash that they had to start the redevelopment efforts. One of the things that happened was this park. This is called Flood Memorial Park. And I will tell you, part of the history of Old North Dayton is that it was flooded in the Great Flood of 1913, which in Dayton is a huge watershed year. Everybody remembers the flood, if you will. Much of Old North Dayton was flooded, so it's a tremendous part of their history and their culture in this neighborhood that the flood happened. 
and it happened at this location. Children's Hospital is actually the remnants of the Smith and Barney Car Works. I'm giving you guys date and history I hadn't even planned to do tonight. This is an added benefit. The Smith and Barney Car Works made um, wooden railroad cars, and it too was flooded during the flood and actually went out of business shortly thereafter because of the flood, but they left the legacy of the Barney Children's Hospital, which has become Children's Medical Center. So those two organizations started out hating each other, brought resources and a political will to the table, asked the city to just facilitate a planning process that made recommendations about residential rehabilitation along with open space planning. Here's some other details of uh, Flood Memorial Park. The, uh, the gate there is actually uh, an illustration or a description in, uh, in graphic terms of what the flood looked like and those columns are uh, the whirlpools of water or something. There's some, some, uh, a lot of uh, symbolism in the park. The park is now maintained by Children's Medical Center who actually takes care of rose bushes. Anybody that knows about maintaining open space knows that that's a commitment. Um, and they continue to fund the Development Corporation to the tune of about $45,000 a year every year. Old North Dayton took a five-year plan that included some fairly large-scale redevelopment, involvement from five neighborhood schools, open space planning, park planning, um, a major transportation improvement, the road that you're looking at here in front and that we saw in front of Children's Medical Center, uh, this, this community and this development corporation as part of the planning process went to Ohio Department of Transportation, not an easy place to get along, and got a $500,000 grant to create a boulevard down the middle of Valley Street, which was part of the plan. So what I'm suggesting to you is this neighborhood without the nice pretty pictures, without the same kind, and don't get me wrong, I was the project planner on this one. This was a good technical plan as well, but it didn't have nearly the kind of design bells and whistles that the Fifth Street plan did. And because the political environment and the political will in the community was stronger, this is the plan that got implemented, not the Fifth Street plan. I would suggest to you that um, the planning role in the Old North Dayton plan was much more one of a facilitator and an orchestrator and somebody who went to the community, worked with them to decide what their issues and needs were, what was going to move them to action, what they really wanted to accomplish, and then helped put that on paper so that they had something to follow. On Fifth Street, the relationship was different. We were much more, it, it, and I wasn't from out of town, but we were much more the professionals from out of town coming in, telling a group of people what we thought, and then their response is, well, we disagree and we're not going to do any of that. So the relationship was much different here. We were, the planners, me included as part of the planning team, were much more involved on, on, a, on a sort of at the ground level with this community and they were much more involved from the very beginning. And now, you ask me which one of these plans is the most successful. Well, this one actually got implemented almost to the T. The other one looked better, but it never got implemented. So I call this one the success. And now, and think about, as I talk about a complicated political environment, a neighborhood plan is probably for most of you who will be involved in planning, the smallest geography that you're ever going to plan for. And we talked a little bit earlier with a group of folks about site planning, and I think site planning is a different kind of an exercise. But whenever we're talking about some kind of comprehensive community planning, a neighborhood or a business district is probably the smallest scale that you're going to work at. And the complicated political environment here is in both places, you've got a neighborhood association, you've got a development corporation, you have a large institution, have a lot of residents, a lot of businesses. All of those folks have got different agendas. They all have different needs out of the neighborhood. Remember, the Old North Dayton plan started out of a pitched battle between the residents and the hospital, who had very different objectives on the same terra firma. And it was the ability of the planning process to sort of bring a common vision, 
to all these disparate folks that made this a successful plan. And it was our inability to do that on Fifth Street that made that an unsuccessful plan. And, and I would really tell you that it was understanding the political environment that made the difference. And in a neighborhood plan, I got fewer actors to deal with than any other place I got to work. Now I want to talk, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to go to the next level because I want to talk about the city's comprehensive planning effort. Um, oh crap, and now I forget which way I was going. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm technically impaired here. Okay, City of Dayton just completed a comprehensive plan, the 2020 vision, which I actually have to tell you, I would not have left Dayton in the middle of the planning process. I just wouldn't have done it. We finished the plan and it had been uh, approved for about six months by the time I left. Um, and let me tell you that a comprehensive plan was not something that Dayton had done in a very long time. Kind of planning horizon for Dayton looks something like this. Um, the last true comprehensive plan that Dayton did was in 1952. In 1979, we did a land use plan, but it had very little policy conversation along with it. It was just strictly a land use plan. And the environment that I got to understand, the environment that's got to plan is the environment where Dayton is hemorrhaging jobs and people it's becoming significantly less relevant in the region that it's in because there are fewer jobs and people. And we think that if current trends continue, the situation only gets bleaker. This is what the employment centers look like in Dayton at the time. And what you see is the migration of jobs to the south and to the east and to the north for Dayton. What you see here is a retail sector that has largely left the community entirely almost no retail left in the community. And, and to some extent, that's an overstatement, but you're hard pressed to buy groceries in the city of Dayton anymore. We have lost a third of our population. We have, and I can just about read that. I used to be able to do this without looking. We used to be 50% of the county's population, and I think most center cities. Dayton is not unusual. This, this statistics page, if you will, is, is not a unique, this one is unique to Dayton, but most center cities in medium-sized um, metropolitan areas look very similar to this. A third of the population in Dayton is poor. 40% of the children who live in Dayton are poor. And we have a public school uh, graduation rate at 50%. Think about that for a minute. Half the kids who start public school in the city of Dayton finish in four years. What happens to the rest of them is anybody's guess, but those are lousy statistics. That's the environment that we get to do a comprehensive plan in. Um, the pr the pr and, and the process that we then put together, which says in that environment, we've got to figure out what all of those, what, what all of the disparate needs and issues and wants and agendas in the community are, facilitate a discussion and then articulate that in some way that we can create a shared vision that's going to move us somewhere. The city commission in Dayton, again, five people, and yes, I can count to three. Now I have to know how to count to five. The city commission began the process and gave us the political clout to start a comprehensive planning process because they said to the city planning commission, yeah, we want you to do a plan, and yeah, we think we might pay attention to it. And that's about what we're saying, because remember, we're in an environment that hasn't had a comprehensive plan since like 1952. So no, pol no politician in Dayton has really had to make a decision based on a planning process for a very long time. And now I got a commission who's saying at least, yeah, we think you ought to go ahead and do that. Um, and we have a planning commission who's willing to take on the task. So now I have a council who's at least neutral on the planning issue, and I have a planning commission who's supportive. But that is not nearly enough to create a plan that anybody's going to pay attention to. We created six committees with 125 people on them that, that we dragged through a two-year planning process. And I will tell you, the process that we went through 
with those 125 people plus another about 500 people that we touched at several meetings was as important as the final recommendations, if not more important, because it, was the, it is those people who will watch Dr. Plan and make sure that the politicians live up to what the planning recommendations and the vision was. We have something called um, priority boards in Dayton, and I'll tell you, I'm missing the priority board system now that I'm in Cincinnati. The city of Dayton is divided into seven priority boards. If you were in Chicago, you would call them wards. Although, because we're from the good government Midwest, we called them priority boards and we pretended like they weren't really political wards. But what the priority boards allowed the city of Dayton to do was have good, quick access to all citizens in the community at one time. And the, the debate about whether priority boards were truly representative is one that we can have some other time. For argument's sake, I'm going to say that what it did was allow us to get in touch with a geographically representative group of citizens in a quick, easy way. Seven priority boards. Cincinnati has 52 neighborhoods, and the only way I can touch base with everybody in the city of Cincinnati is to deal with 52 separate neighborhood organizations. Talk about a logistics nightmare. And we're trying to figure out how to create something that we can deal with in a different sort of way. I told you that I had six committees. And I, I have this slide, even though you all don't know who Dr. Michael Irvin is, because I want to discuss the politics of some of the folks that were on the committees that are going to take this plan forward. Dr. Michael Irvin was uh, a doctor in the community who had been instrumental in the EMS and health care system that uh, Dayton has right now and is also the chairman of the Downtown Dayton Partnership. Got to have downtown. Youth and Education and Human Services, Joey Williams at the time was, excuse me, Joey Williams was the president, or the president of the school board. Nick Koontz was a juvenile court judge. If what Dayton says, if, if, if one of our problems is half the kids who start high school don't graduate, and the reason that Dayton neighborhoods are losing population and going into disinvestment is because everybody with kids moves out of town, that obviously I got to deal with schools. I'm not getting anywhere with schools unless I got the school board at least in the conversation. That's somebody with a different agenda and a different set of needs that I now have to involve in a physical planning process. Dr. David Ponence um, was the president and is now the, yeah, he was the president at the time. He's now the past president of Sinclair Community College. Tremendous amount of credibility in town, both with the business community and with the resident community. Economic development, Mike Adler, the president of Moto Photo, lives in Dayton, by the way. Open space quality of life, Mary Matthews was the director of the Carillon Historical Park. Significant historical resource for us in Dayton. And Bill Gillespie was assistant city manager for the city of Dayton. What you got up there is probably one of the most important pictures as to why, if the city of Dayton plan is successful, it will be successful. Because we had business community, government, and residents all at the table with the Board of Education committed to the process. Which means, to some extent, they're committed to the outcome. And we certainly fought. I, I will tell you that as we went through the process, we fought. But we ended up with this vision which all of those folks bought into, which eventually means they will all act on, we hope. Dayton, as a placemaker in the region, wanted to be the center of manufacturing. Uh, and this is, all, I, I think a lot of people are interested by that recommendation. Dayton's uh, economic fortune was made on manufacturing cars and refrigerators and cash registers. And although we understand on a national level that manufacturing is a, is a sector of the economy in decline, in Dayton it is still a significant sector of the economy and has diversified to the extent that we believe we can continue to hold on to that niche of the economy in a way that the suburban communities and other parts of the region could not because they were unwilling to. That we had a core of historic and well-established neighborhoods that we were going to revitalize, but that we aren't going to try to compete with suburbs who are creating greenfield suburban developments because we can't. That's a battle that you just don't win. 
because we don't have the same kind of an environment. So we have to create a different kind of a niche. That Dayton will be, will be, was, and always will be the home of arts and culture. In Dayton, that means the Wright brothers and Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I mean, you knew that the Wright brothers were from Dayton. I know the Dayton residents did. There we go. <laughs> um, that downtown Dayton will continue to be the Miami Valley's downtown. What does that mean? Well, in a city like Dayton, maybe, maybe not so much in a city like Muncie, certainly in a city like Dayton, in a city like Cincinnati, in a city like Indianapolis, the more and more residents move out of the center city and they take their jobs out of the center city, the less reason people have to come downtown. Yet it is still geographically the center of the region and there are resources in downtowns that can't be replicated or at least haven't been replicated yet in other parts of the community. Generally the cultural resources like in Dayton it's the Art Institute and the Victoria Theater and the performing arts largely continue to reside downtown and that we're the keeper of the heritage and the culture of the community. Dayton looks different than Indianapolis and Cincinnati and Columbus and Toledo to the extent that it does based on what it looks like in town, because the suburbs of all of those communities look pretty much the same. So the character and the culture of the community needs to continue to reside in Dayton. This is the land use plan that we created in uh, 1979. And if you don't see much of a pattern there, I would suggest that, that that's not a surprise. If, if, if there's any pattern that you see, it's that the uh, industrial property that's uh, purple on the map there really runs up and down the Great Miami and the Little Miami Rivers. In truth, Dayton, like many other Midwestern communities, was developed for, for our purposes in about four different time periods. And if anybody has had your planning theory and that looks like a concentric ring theory, it absolutely is. And it's real. I mean, it, it really does happen on the ground. Um, what I would suggest to you is that downtown Dayton and our urban core was developed before the turn of the century. And it has the character of a downtown. Buildings built at zero lot lines, parking as an accessory use, lots of high rise buildings. That's the character of downtown. The next zone, which we called the urban mature zone, was built between the turn of the century and about 1920. Uh, not designed for the auto. Uh, these are our historic districts, neighborhood business districts without parking. Uh, alleys for alleys in neighborhoods. The character of these neighborhoods was that of a community that was built before everybody had a car. The next zone is the urban eclectic zone because we couldn't think of a better name. We worked and worked on a better name and we still have urban eclectic. That part of the community that was built between about 1920 and 1960. And this is really the transitional zone. Business districts that maybe have five parking spaces in the front. Um, streets that maybe have detached garages because people are starting to drive cars. Uh, buildings are set back a little farther, spread out a little bit more. Um, we're starting to see the influence of the car, but it doesn't dominate. And the last zone, which is the yellow zone, which if you could tell where Dayton's boundaries is, Dayton doesn't have a complete suburban zone, but those are parts of the community that were built after 1960. And they are pretty much traditionally suburban kinds of development patterns. What we said was that we needed to take the recommendations, the policy recommendations that we developed, and put them on the ground in a way that respected this physical development pattern. And what that ended up being in a land use plan is this. We still have, for those of you who have been in that uh, planning theory class, the uh, industrial sectors that run along the river, and it really does look like this, and what you can see in that land use plan is you can see the urban core, you can see the urban mature zone in that yellow area, you can see the uh, urban eclectic zone in the beige area, and you can see the suburban zone in the yellow there. And what we really intend to do is create a land use plan and a zoning code which responds to those kinds of development characteristics as opposed to what most communities have, which is a zoning code that was that was rewritten in 1960 and designed to accommodate suburban development because that's what was happening in 1960, suburban development. So zoning codes look like they ought to have been written so that everybody will have a curvilinear street. Well, what happens in a community like Dayton where 80% of the community is of a different physical character than that, you end up constantly trying to shove a round peg in a square hole. 
and it's why nobody likes the zoning code. The comprehensive plan for the city of Dayton also had the kind of detail in it that would suggest um, physical development. This is Tool Town, which is a downtown development project that, remember I said we were going to be the center of manufacturing? This is a recommendation to take an old GM site, which is a brownfield site, immediately adjacent downtown, and create a tool and manufacturing, a tool and machining campus that would attract at least four large anchor tenants and a lot of other tool and machining industries. Hopefully about 4,000 jobs right adjacent downtown. This is a riverfront uh, park that's in backwards, but you don't know that because you don't know which side that thing's on. <laughs> and this is a residential redevelopment plan uh, in a historic district, right Dunbar, just over the river on the other side from downtown, which responds to the urban mature characteristics that I described earlier. So, what, what I essentially described to you to begin with in the comprehensive plan was a tough, a tough kind of an environment to plan in. And a whole collection of folks who you wouldn't typically think of as need to be involved in a planning process who are absolutely critical to getting on board or we aren't going anywhere. We're ending up back like East Fifth Street. We spent almost nine months at the beginning of the comprehensive planning process assembling the people who populated the committees that we used so that we would have good representation and people who could implement actually in the process from the beginning so that they would be part of making the recommendations. And I think that that's critical to implement to what's going to be implementation. Um, there is a coordinating committee now that's been developed and is largely made up of the people who chaired the original committees along with labor, organized labor from the city of Dayton, which is a, is a very important crew. Um, oh, thank you, Paul. It's got recommendations that are tied to budget. City of Dayton has a budget of about $178 million a year. Uh, if you could spend a third of that on planning recommendations, imagine what kind of capital you'd have to work with, and you have a private sector who's bringing that same kind of stuff to the table as well. We have department business plans like economic development and community development, which is planning and communal development department that I manage, who are responsible for creating a work program that actually implements the comprehensive plan. And I would tell you, I think a lot of where planning falls down is that it doesn't do this kind of work. We want to do what we did on East Fifth Street, which, was do, which is do the design and get the technical answers right. But the important steps to take to get you beyond that and get something actually built or change the way a community responds is in this kind of work budgeting and scheduling and creating plan, business plans that make somebody do something different because of a plan recommendation. We built a baseball stadium. You saw the riverfront, tool town, airplex, link manufacturing. These are some of the plan, uh, the particular projects that are happening in Dayton right now as a result of the comprehensive plan. Uh, here are some specific projects that came out of the comprehensive plan in the housing area that are happening. Um, a housing court docket, building services, again, some processes that had to change so that what we said would happen in the plan actually happens. Okay, that's it for the slides. I'm going to finish up now. I just have a couple of other, of other things. I said I was going to talk about three different um, three different levels of planning. We talked about neighborhood planning. We talked about citywide planning. I want to talk a little bit about regional or metropolitan planning now. Much of what um, the planning profession is talking about now, in when we talk about smart growth and sustainable communities, are issues that end up happening in regional forums. The complexity of regional forums is even more difficult than the complexity of citywide comprehensive forums. Now I got to include suburban jurisdictions who have very different interests than center cities. And I got to include rural jurisdictions who have yet a whole different set of agendas and needs. 
and I have to include transportation funding organizations like the Ohio Department of Transportation and the Indiana Department of Transportation and a whole bunch of other players. But what I would like to suggest to you is that the kinds of issues that I think from a community standpoint we're going to be struggling with in the next 20 years like sprawl, like concentrations of poverty, like environmental degradation and environmental equity, like character and quality of life. Those are issues that can only get resolved at a regional level. And I think that planners are going to have a tremendous amount to offer as we discuss those issues. But I think we're only going to be successful if we understand the political environment that all of those conversations are going to take place in. And with that, I think I'm going to stop and ask, what do you want to ask for questions? If anybody has any questions. Everybody up there in the back probably has questions, right? That's why you sat up there. No? Failed plan, total loss, or is there a way to eventually I, solve some of the political climate and, and get some results from that? I continue to think that that technically those were the cor those were right answers and those were good sound planning recommendations. I think though that until the neighborhood and the business district that those places that those recommendations were in really buy into that it isn't going to happen and i'm not sure you can ever go back at the back end and create buy-in i'm just not sure that's ever going to happen because i think one of the important things about buy-in is it's a good idea if it's my idea and if it's your idea i don't like it and so to to create environments where it can be your idea i think is really important and, and I'm just not sure you can go back and sort of convince somebody of that too far after the fact. Yeah. What kind of course do you recommend for a young designer who's outside of Political science courses. I mean, I, <laughs> I think it's really important for planning students to know how to write and, uh, and present well. <laughs> And show myself up that way. But I think communicating is really important verbally as well as graphically. English courses, writing courses, and a lot of times when we interview people, um, those are the kind of skills that we're looking for. Paul, did you tell those people? Paul told me that 187 times before I ever got out of my first class with him. You have to know how to write well, and that's very good advice. <laughs> Yes. The uh, City of Dayton and Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, MVRPC, which was our regional planning organization in the 70s under the leadership of Dale Birch, developed a fair share housing plan. One of the issues that I said I thought was going to be important was dealing with concentrations of poverty. One of the ways that you deal with concentrations of poverty is dispersing affordable housing options. But Nobody wants low-income housing in their backyard. So it's a difficult discussion to have on a regional level. Dayton, in the early 70s, developed a fair share housing plan, which actually, for every suburban community in Dayton, identified how many affordable housing units they ought to have, also identified how many um, assisted housing units, housing beds, ought to be existing in each suburban community. And in fact, Dale Birch, who's now professor at Ohio State, got shown the door for that plan. And it really, although there was um, some coordination and collaboration at the front end and everybody was at least willing to sit down with the county to get the numbers down, I think it went, it didn't go very far in implementation. Uh, there was some low-income housing in Centerville and Chevy Chase. Um, and a couple of other communities took on some low-income housing, but largely I would say it didn't go anywhere after that. And Dale Birch was not the director of Miami Valley Regional Plan Commission very much longer after that plan got, um, 
got approved. So I think that one was mixed results. Uh, the county and the city in Dayton continue to push for dispersal of affordable housing options, and it continues to be a really difficult conversation to have. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, Paul's asking me. Paul's whispering at me up here. Repeat the question. The question was, how do? And I'm going to paraphrase. And if I get this wrong, correct me. How do center cities who have who have a lot of existing housing stock address the need to construct new housing stock? Well, uh, in, in of course, urban renewal is one way. We just tear it all down, um, which is, I think, planning as a profession decided that that was a bad decision that we all made years ago and have sort of tried to retrench our steps after that. However, um, one of the interesting, Dayton has dealt with this and we dealt with it in our comprehensive plan. If you're losing population like crazy, you probably have a lot of vacant housing. Um, and in fact, Dayton and many center cities have a lot of vacant housing. It's probably the housing in the worst shape. It's also probably housing that's got some historic value. Um, but with a lot of vacant, abandoned housing, the entire housing market, the value is sort of artificially depressed, if you would, because there's so much excess supply, supply and demand economics thing. So I think that what Dayton um, is working on is an aggressive rehabilitation program to bring vacant units back online at much higher um, quality levels than they used to be. We've done this thing called Rehabarama several years now where we've taken abandoned buildings in historic neighborhoods where we believe that we could get the market value of the house high enough to do $150,000 renovations and then sell them back into the market almost like new units. The other, um, and I, the other piece to that though, and I think we all got planning, got such a bad rap I can't believe I'm going to say this. Planning got such a bad rap when we were sort of in the whole scale urban renewal clearance business that planners have been very reluctant to make recommendations about doing selective demolition ever again because it looked like such a stupid thing the first time we did it. But if you read some of the smart growth literature, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Tom Beyer out of Cleveland State University, but he did a, a large housing study for the state of Ohio. And what he said to housing producers in Ohio was, until center cities can provide housing that is of similar character, maybe not yard size, but character to what somebody who's moving up and out gets to buy in the burbs, we're never going to be able to capture a big enough piece of the housing market to get people back in the city. So what we got to do is find somewhere in center cities to build new housing. And I think that's going to lead us to do some more selective demolition recommendations than we have been in the past. Yeah. Um, there are all kinds of interesting bedfellows and interesting relationships forming around the whole regional issue of sprawl. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about in Dayton, there has been a proposal on the books to build the western half of a beltway, a roadway, large beltway around the western part of Montgomery County. Totally agricultural part of the community. Very few destinations. The intent would be to, to connect I-70 with I-75 in the western part of the county. Obviously, Dayton wasn't happy about that recommendation, and we fought that recommendation, saying that it would be one more destination that would attract people out of Dayton and our inner suburbs to another economic development location. 
we ended up as political allies, and I, I think this is a good thing, we, we, political allies with the rural counties and the Farm Bureau on the western side of Montgomery County who also didn't want the road for very different reasons, but they became allies of ours and eventually brought Montgomery County over because Montgomery County considers an important voting block of theirs, the farmers in western Montgomery County. And so we ended up with this very strange coalition of folks who was in opposition to a roadway, but in effect it became a very powerful organization. Um, and, and just as another part of the response, I, I think in this game of sprawl, center cities look like the losers, and we are, we certainly are the losers, and agricultural communities look like the losers because they get overrun, and the suburbs look like the winners at this point. But I think that increasingly, and we talked about this a little earlier tonight, suburban communities are deciding that they are also not getting what they want because what people were going to the suburbs to find, which was some kind of a, I'm going to talk negatively about the suburbs, so I can't help it. I've worked in center cities too long. Um, this kind of idyllic lifestyle that people are looking for in the suburbs is, in fact, there's more traffic congestion in the suburbs than there is in the center city. Uh, convenient shopping is farther away from those folks, and their gen the logistics of their lifestyle is not what they had hoped it would be. And so I think even suburban communities that right now look like the winners are finding out that this thing that we're creating is not their objective either. I, I have to tell the story. I, I was at a uh, regional sprawl conference or, or seminar at, uh, in Dayton in Montgomery County, and uh, this was a whole regional community talking about sprawl and whether we thought it was a good thing or a bad thing. And the Dayton Daily News actually sponsored this series. And this one woman just who lived in the suburbs and she just lamented the fact, she says, I just don't know what to do. I think this sprawling development pattern is awful. She says, I've moved three times to get out of the sprawl. And she says, what can we do? And I said, stop moving. It's your fault. Don't you see? People don't understand the relationship. So, and she absolutely didn't get it. When I told her to stop moving, she just didn't get it. But, I mean, <laughs> about the personal decisions that you make and sort of having a conscious decision from a public policy standpoint that that isn't what we're going to do. So, anyway. <laughs> we have time for one more question? When you say family structure, do you mean sort of the community character or um, it's not gone in all neighborhoods. It's certainly gone or weak in a lot of neighborhoods. And I, I happen to be um, a big believer in neighborhood schools. I think that one of the things that happened that really changed the character of community was that people stopped sending their kids down to the corner school. And suddenly, that relationship, that big piece of community life was gone. And I think that in, in neighborhoods in Dayton, where today there is a strong sense of character, it's largely around places where there still are neighborhood schools, either parochial or public, where they've, we've been able to maintain that neighborhood school character. It's kind of an about way, but I mean, I, I think that that's an important piece of it. Yes. See, and already, as soon as I said we ought to do selective demolition, I'm already starting to sweat the recommendation. But, <laughs> but yes, I mean, in places where, I mean, to some extent, it's about triage in neighborhoods. Some places, there's a character that you can save and revitalize, and in other places, there isn't. And we've got to understand that. And because you, you can, there just isn't enough money in the world to save the places where the character isn't there to begin with. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. This is fun.